Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new Mega Projects video. This one's all about the Hubble Space Telescope. This one has been crazy requested. Every video, someone, uh, not one individual person, but people are posting, do the Hubble Space Telescope. The problem is, every time I make a video about something in space, people are like, nah, I don't want to watch that. <laughs> they do quite badly. So hopefully, this will do okay, because I have to impress today's sponsor, Blinkist. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com forward slash megaprojects will get one week to try it out. You'll also get 25% off if you want the full membership, which you probably will. Let's get into it, shall we? To coin a well-worn phrase, space, the final frontier. Oh my god, I'm such a Star Trek nerd, I love it. Our knowledge of what lies beyond this rock orbiting an even bigger and considerably hotter rock or, well, really gas, is still pitiful when you think about the scale of the universe. But it is growing rapidly, and this is in no small part down to a certain satellite that has been orbiting the Earth for the last 30 years, five months, and counting. It is, of course, the Hubble Space Telescope. And my mind was just blown by the fact that it's been up there for 30 years. I had no idea. I swear I can remember it going up. The Hubble Space Telescope, will just go by its first name from now on, has been a phenomenal success on many levels. The imagery it has beamed down to Earth has been some of the clearest, most dazzling pictures we've ever seen of the universe around us. It has led to numerous breakthroughs in astrophysics and, in particular, to determine the rate of expansion of the universe, now known as Hubble's Law. But Hubble has also done something that isn't always recorded. It's electrified interest in space, and those wondrous images that began to emerge in the 90s set off a public relations boom when it came to astronomy. Suddenly, we were looking at pictures so astonishing, they looked like they must have been designed by a computer. The rich colors and spectacular patterns created naturally began to show us space in a completely different light. Our final frontier was changing. The first mention of a possible telescope in space came almost 100 years ago. A paper titled something in German that I'm not going to try and pronounce, but translated is The Rocket Into Planetary Space, was published by three men. One German, one American, and one Russian. Hermann Oberth, Robert H. Goddard, and Konstantin Silikovsky. Obviously, nothing came of it that early. Space travel was still quite a way off, and we still had yet to destroy half the world during World War II. After the war, the idea came back into fashion with the help of American astronomer Lyman Spitzer, who wrote a paper entitled Astronomical Advantages of an Extraterrestrial Observatory. These academic guys have super catchy names on their papers. The two advantages he was alluding to were the angular resolution, which is the smallest point of separation between two objects to appear clearly distinguishable would be much less in space than on Earth. An object viewed from space would only be affected by diffraction, which is the resolution of an optical imaging system, and not by turbulence in our atmosphere. If you've ever wondered why stars twinkle, I have. Well, that's because we're viewing them through everything going on in our atmosphere. In 1946, ground-based telescopes were limited to resolutions of 0.5 to 1 arcseconds of a degree. An arcsecond is 1 3,600th of a degree, while Spitzer stated that a telescope in space would have a diffraction-limited resolution of about 0.05 arcseconds for a telescope with a mirror 2.5 meters in diameter. In short, this meant it could cover much more of the sky. Secondly, a space telescope would also be able to observe infrared and ultraviolet light, both of which is heavily absorbed by our atmosphere, meaning land telescopes often struggle to pick them up. Perhaps the true beauty of space could be fully revealed by just looking at it from outside our planet. It all sounds super logical, but it took more than two decades for things to really get going. Remember, this was a point in time when we seemed to be more focused on destroying our planet through nuclear war than investigating the far reaches of space. In 1965, Spitzer was named head of a committee that would begin seriously exploring the scientific objectives that might come from such a telescope. But that's not to say that early telescopes hadn't already been launched. An orbiting solar telescope had been part of the Ariel 1 mission in 1962 by the UK. However, this satellite had a short life as it was disabled thanks to a high-altitude nuclear test by the United States known as Starfish Prime on the 9th of July 1962. I've actually made a video all about that on my other channel today, I found out, and I believe that was the UK's first satellite that essentially the United States nuked out of space. 
Thanks, guys. In 1966, NASA launched the first purpose built telescope, known a little blandly, let's be honest, as Orbiting Astronomical Observatory OAO. This mission lasted all of three days before the batteries failed. OAO 2 followed a few years later and proved to be much more successful than its older brother. Between 1968 and 1972, it sent back ultraviolet observations of stars and galaxies, the likes of which had never been seen before. The success of OAO2 led to a widespread belief among astronomers that a large-scale telescope was vital. However, the US government had other ideas. This was a time of the moon landings and a war in Vietnam that was not only spiraling out of control, but costing US taxpayers astronomical amounts of money. The total cost of the war, by the way, was placed at around $168 billion, and that's past money. That'd be about a trillion dollars today. Spending cuts in 1974 led to funding for the telescope program being cut, but astronomers, they're a bit of a hardy and determined bunch. A nationwide effort to lobby the government to change its stance got underway. The National Academy of Sciences published a report underpinning the importance of a space telescope. The US Senate eventually relented, sort of, with just half of the original budget reinstated. The funding cuts led to a reduction in the size of the proposed mirror from 3 meters to 2.4 meters, as well as dropping a trial satellite that would have tested many of Hubble's components beforehand. But the cuts also led to a new partnership, and that was with the European Space Agency. The ESA would provide funding as well as instruments for the telescope solar cells and staff in return for 15% of observing time on Hubble. Now just before we get into the rest of today's video, I do want to take a moment to thank our amazing sponsor Blinkist. Look, it's not always easy to find time to sit down and read all the books you want. I'm pretty busy. Like, I make a lot of YouTube videos. You guys know that. Even on this channel, it's three videos. I used to read a lot. I used to read a lot of nonfiction, and I just read less than I would want to these days. But good news, I have Blinkist. Blinkist is an app that you can download, and then basically inside it, there are 15 minute summaries of all the best nonfiction books. There are over 3,000 of them. And I haven't actually listened to this Blinkist yet, but I'm actually reading the full book version of a book called Rebel Ideas by, I think it's pronounced Matthew Saeed, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's a great book, and I was like, I wonder if Blinkist have it. It came out fairly recently, so, I mean, have they already got a Blinkist version of it? And, well, surprise, surprise, yes they have, and, uh, well, if I ever need, and I will, I will go and use the Blinkist for that in the future, because we forget books. I will read that book, and then a year later I'll be like, I don't remember what it was about at all. Blinkist is amazing for, for getting the summary afterwards and reminding yourself, but also, Look, if you don't have time to read it, Blinkist it. 14 million active users currently using the app to get the best insights, need to know information. Look, my recommendation, even though I haven't actually done the Blinkist version of it yet, is that Matthew Said book, Rebel Ideas. There's lots of great stuff in there. You'll get the key stuff from the Blink. Um, loads of other, what else? Oh yeah, Factfulness. That's one I've had before. What else have I got on here? Uh, the Snowball. Warren Buffett's autobiography. That's a good one. Is it a biography or autobiography? I don't even remember. But I could remind myself with Blinkist. Look, that's what it's all about. Get first hundred people to go to Blinkist.com forward slash mega projects. You get a week to try it out. 25% off your membership. And let's get back to the video. Hubble was constructed by numerous institutions in various locations. The Marshall Space Flight Center, MSFC, in Alabama would design, develop, and construct the telescope. The Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland was placed in control of the scientific instruments and ground control center for the mission. American company Perkin Elmer would design and build the optical telescope assembly, OTA, and Lockheed would build the spacecraft, which would house the telescope. The most difficult aspect of the entire operation, and the main reason Hubble went into space in 1990 rather than the early or mid 80s, was was the OTA. Like most large-scale telescopes, Hubble is based on a Ritchie Creton design with two hyperbolic mirrors. It is a design that can provide excellent imaging over a wide area, but the shapes required for such mirrors are notoriously hard to build and test. Production of the OTA began in 1979 with two pieces of ultra-low expansion glass, each 25 millimeters, one inch thick. Between the glass was a honeycomb lattice, which is a structure of graphene, an allotrope of carbon, where a single layer of atoms is 
arranged in a two-dimensional honeycomb pattern. Optical telescopes are normally polished to an accuracy of about a tenth of the wavelength of visible light. However, Hubble needed an accuracy of 10 nanometers, or about 1 65th of the wavelength of red light. Getting the OTA to this point would take longer than anybody had envisioned. The mirror was completed by the end of 1981 and received a thorough wash involving 9,100 liters of hot, deionized water. The next step was to give it a reflective coating of 65 nanometers thick aluminium and a protective coating of 25 nanometers thick magnesium fluoride. But this process was slipping further and further behind schedule. Doubts over Perkin Elmer's competence over such a complex task began to be openly voiced. The launch was pushed back to 1985, then 1986, with the new costs now reaching $1.175 billion, which is about $3 billion today. As problems continued with the OTA, the rest of the construction was progressing smoothly, although Lockheed's budget went 30% over what had been estimated. By the mid-1980s, most of Hubble was ready to go. This would include a total of five scientific instruments, the Wide Field and Planetary Camera WFPC, used for wide images and close-ups, the Goddard High Resolution Spectrograph GHRS, designed to operate in ultraviolet light, and the High Speed Photometer HSB, used to measure the brightness and polarity of rapidly varying celestial objects. The Faint Object Camera FOC and the Faint Object Spectrograph FOS provided the highest spatial resolution of any cameras on Hubble. A launch in 1986 was on the cards until the events of January the 29th, 1986 caused the entire space program to come to a grinding halt. The Challenger disaster, in which all seven crew on board died, was a horrifying moment that was broadcast on live television. While investigations took place, Hubble remained pending. To make things more complicated, the telescope needed to be kept in a clean room that was purged constantly with nitrogen to maintain its delicate mirrors. If you think something like this is expensive, it absolutely is. It cost around $6 million. $14 million today, every single month. But the time finally came, and on April the 24th, 1990, oh my god, the cost of that clean room for years. <laughs> That's insane. Space Shuttle Discovery eventually launched, and the Hubble Space Telescope was on board. But this was no fairy tale for Hubble. Within weeks, it became obvious that there were serious flaws with the mirrors. They were a bit blurry. These had been some of the most precisely designed mirrors in history, but they'd got the numbers wrong. The outer perimeter was too flat by roughly 2,200 nanometers. That's 1 450th of a millimeter, by the way, so fairly tiny. However, this is a really precise machine, and this basically greatly reduced Hubble's ability to view distant objects. It was a terrible start for Hubble, and some questioned whether the project would actually be abandoned. The next service mission was scheduled for 1993, which meant NASA had three years to come up with a solution, and their answer was brilliant in its simplicity. Replacing the mirrors while orbiting was entirely impractical and would have cost a small fortune. Instead, they designed a new optical component that would go over the mirror. This would have the same error as the original, but in reverse, and if this is sounding familiar, it's how glasses work. These spectacles came with the Corrective Optics Space Telescope Axial Replacement, COSTAR, and it was launched on the 2nd of December 1993. It was successfully installed over 11 days, and just like that, Hubble was ready to go. Hubble was always designed so that we might better understand the universe around us. So, well, what have we learned so far from Hubble? Let's start with how old is the universe? While we're probably never going to get a complete picture of this, Hubble has helped to understand the age of the universe. Part of its mission was to measure distances to sepiate variable stars, those which pulsate rapidly in more depth than we'd ever done before, which would lead to a better understanding of how quickly the universe is expanding. This has all led to current estimates that the universe is 13.7 billion years old, give or take a little bit. Next up, what are black holes? Well, we're still only beginning to understand the anomaly that are black holes, but Hubble has been able to show us that black holes lie in the center of nearby galaxies, and this is something astronomers are starting to believe might be a common trait among them. Next up, what is around us? It may sound a little obvious, but Hubble has enabled us to see more of the universe than we ever have. In 2016, researchers using Hubble announced they had found the farthest known galaxy, GNZ11, at an incomprehensible 32 billion light years away. To put that in some kind of perspective that our human brain might understand, the distance from Earth to Pluto is just 0.000628 light years. 
Comparing that to 32 billion, I mean, I just know it's absolutely massive. It doesn't really help me comprehend the insane distance that is. Next, are our predictions correct? In 2015, Hubble captured images of the first predicted reappearance of a supernova. Four images of the supernova, which exploded 10 billion years ago, had been seen in 2014, and scientists were able to calculate when and where a fifth would appear based on different mass models of galaxy clusters. They were able to prove their theories correct with the help of Hubble. Hubble's not going to live forever. If left to its own devices, it will eventually be pulled into the Earth's atmosphere and it will once again re-enter our world a lot less delicately that time. We've recently done a video on Skylab, the first attempt at a space station by the United States, which ended in an uncontrolled re-entry that struck fear into the heart of many because NASA just couldn't say where exactly it was going to smash into the Earth. But they've learned their lesson, and in 2009, during its fourth service mission, Hubble had a soft capture mechanism, SCM, attached to it, which in theory will allow for a controlled re-entry. When this will happen, we don't know, but current estimates say that Hubble's re-entry could occur between 2028 and 2040. So so, just a 12-year window of possibility there. At least it's a controlled entry. Hopefully. As for a potential successor, well, there's nothing quite like Hubble on the horizon. But there are a few would-be pretenders to the throne. The most natural successor is the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, a collaboration between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency, which will operate further away from Earth than Hubble and is due to launch in 2021. A true 21st century design will be the large ultraviolet optical infrared surveyor with a planned 8 to 16.8 meter mirror, which would be more powerful than Hubble. This is still currently early in development, and it is hoped it will be ready sometime between 2025 and 2035. The impact that Hubble has had on astronomy has been staggering. Over 15,000 papers based on Hubble data have been published since it began operations, and it continues to wow us with images of the universe. But its reputation was severely dented in the first few years of the 1990s, with Hubble becoming the butt of many jokes. Yet the telescope came storming back, and it's difficult not to look at it as one of the most important pieces of hardware that humans have ever constructed. Yes, it came at a high cost. The original estimate of $400 million, $1.5 billion today, eventually rose to $4.7 billion or $9.3 billion today at the time of launch. Twenty years later, the cumulative cost was thought to be over $10 billion. This is a massive amount of money, however, that's only around one hundredth of what the US spent on the war in Vietnam. The new Gerald R. Ford aircraft carrier cost nearly $40 billion to build, and many are questioning whether we really need those monsters anymore. Hubble was expensive, but still pales in comparison to what our governments regularly spend money on. On a day-to-day -day basis, much of what we've learned from Hubble is not exactly important to our lives. I mean, is it really super important that we know there's an astronomical object of an unknown type called SCP-06-F6 in a galaxy cluster known as CL-1432.5 plus 332.8? Do we need to know that? Not really, but now you do. But the reality is that humans like looking beyond the horizon. It's thrilling to find out what's out there. The mysteries of the universe are often beyond our mortal comprehension, but that doesn't mean we should stop trying or stop looking. Looking at a picture from Hubble of a far-off galaxy, it's easy to swoon over the colors and shapes, but don't forget that something humans built can do that. Hubble will be remembered for centuries to come, and it is our privilege to witness this extraordinary telescope in action. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that like button below. If you'd like to support the show and get something fantastic in return for that support, check out Blinkist for that free trial. Link below. And thank you for watching.